Hello, everybody, and welcome to Youth Stories and Innovations for a Food-Hungry World. Happy World Food Week. Um, I'm Frank Sesno. It is my absolute pleasure and privilege to be with you today and to lead a conversation that I know you will find fascinating and inspiring because we are going to hear from some remarkable young people who are doing remarkable things with their ideas and their innovations, but also the stories they tell around them. World Food Day marks the founding of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, and it promotes global action to end hunger and ensure healthy diets for everybody on this planet. This year's theme is Leave No One Behind, Better Production, Better Nutrition, A Better Environment, and A Better Life. And no one could put it better than that. It is a true and awesome, but completely achievable, ambitious goal. This year, we're excited to be part of the World Food Forum. Uh, we're organizing a regional satellite event, we here being Planet Forward, which is based at the George Washington University and in, involves universities across the United States and around the world. We're doing this in partnership with the FAO Liaison Office for North America. The World Food Forum is a new platform, really, that's gaining momentum and activating youth solutions for food systems and their transformation. And Planet Forward, which has collaborated with FAO for several years now, really engages students in how they tell their stories, how they share that information, how they inform, inspire, organize, mobilize others to be aware and to act. Uh, we've in the past been able to go with uh, FAO and, and to FAO in Rome uh, for our students to report what they see here from, uh, from that, that amazing city during the Committee on World Food Security meetings. So this is one of several events taking place from all regions of the world as part of the World Food Forum to mobilize uh, youth action. Uh, we're gonna highlight different perspectives here that youth are taking, uh, as I said, through innovation, research, and storytelling. And so I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful panelists, starting with Candace Kendo Clark. She is a PhD student at Tuskegee University, the famous and wonderful Tuskegee. Hi. Kendo, how are you? I'm good, Frank. I'm great. How are you today? I'm great. So you are a sustainable food resource specialist. You focus on sustainable development in the Black Belt and the diaspora. You're the founder of Farm Plug, which is inter, uh, sort of an intergenerational initiative, right, to connect ag and, and, and the culture. So what got you in this? Man, food is really my life. Um, ag is life at this point. Uh before I really understood what food meant to me, I grew up, you know, on the south side of Chicago and I got to see my grandfather who didn't have more than a fifth grade education and, you know, paying homage to the ancestors. Um, he wound up owning his house and the lot next to it and he had aquaponics and koi fish. So food has always been a part of my life. It's been a part of the way that my family is gathered and showed love. So that's how I became the farm plug. It's really um, a bunch of my experiences as a black woman all over the world. Awesome. So that's the food and the stories and the inspiration and the innovation. So we're going to come back on that. Our next panelist to join us is Maria Vdalea La Montagna. She's an agronomist and a PhD student in animal sciences at Laval University in Quebec, the wonderful Canada. And she's co-founder of INSCOT. Uh, hi, Maria. Welcome to you. Thanks for joining. Hi. What is INSCOT? So INSCOT is an entrepreneurial project who aims to improve the sustainability of our agri-food production system by using the, the potential of edible insects, so black soldier fly larva, uh, for a better management of the food waste coming from the farm and to create new alter alternative ecological ingredients to feed uh, livestock. So I just want to make sure I heard that right. I think I heard edible insects right yes that's right but edible insect to feed the animals not feed the animals. Animals. okay great well that's an amazing innovation and an idea and um you've done amazing things with it and you've been recognized for that so we'll talk some more about that we're also joined our third panelist is uh, mariah gladstone uh she uh is a blackfeet ecologist uh, she says she's masquerading as a chef she's not masquerading as founder of indigi kitchen so mariah welcome to you Hello, so good to be here. Tell uh, everybody a little bit about Indigi Kitchen and what that is. Yeah, Indigi Kitchen is an online platform dedicated to revitalizing indigenous food systems. 
by reconnecting people with indigenous food knowledge. Uh, and you're doing that how? Uh, I make videos, I do cooking classes online. Right now, I'm very lucky to be in Rome at the World Food Forum. So I am also cooking and sharing indigenous recipes in person um, and am able to showcase indigenous knowledge with that platform. So part of the storytelling. Okay, you told us you're in Rome. Let me come back to Kendo and to um, Marieva, just to so that everybody knows, where are you speaking to us from? coming to us from. Kendall, where are you right now? Oh, I'm coming from the illustrious Tuskegee University, home of the George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington. And you've been a student there for a few years, so you know it well and you know the region well. Yes, definitely. In the heart of the, we, I'm calling it the heart of the Black Belt, right next door to Montgomery, which is the birthplace of the civil rights movement. Um, but you, it's really impossible to talk about food and sustainability um, without talking about George Washington Carver. So um, I'm here and I'm representing with all of the love that I can muster up, for sure. I'm just going to ask you this because we have a global audience and not everybody might know who George Washington Carver is. So you want to mm -hmm. give a line or two about his biography so everyone appreciates what you appreciate? For sure. So if you've heard of uh, th more than 300 innovations with the peanut, um, the father of crop rotation and rotational grazing, uh, George Washington Carver is basically the man who saved the South um, when all of the farmers in the South had depleted the soil from cotton, from slavery and things like that. He came in with his innovations of just really walking outside and using little to no resources. And he managed to create so many innovations, not even just with the peanut, but also with soybeans and sweet potatoes. Awesome. Mariev, uh, where are you and where are you coming to us from? Yeah, so uh, I'm talking from Quebec City in the Quebec, Canada. Uh, so I'm living uh, near uh, Laval University where I study. So it's a beautiful university with the uh, agronomy uh, program. So it's a good place to uh, and or not how to develop new innovation for our sector. Okay, let's let's dive into what each of you is working on, um, and 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 get a better sense of of what um, the particulars are. Uh, I will invite our audience to uh, post questions, and we'll get to those uh, in a little bit when we open it up. Mariah, let me start with you. Tell us, uh, you, you gave us a little bit of a of a sense about Indigi Kitchen, but. Um, Come back on that a little bit more and, 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 and let's explain what it is, um, what you're trying to accomplish with it. And this question was really started because of the epidemic of diet related illnesses in Indian country. And from that came this need, not just to restore access to traditional foods, but also to make sure that people knew what to do with them. And so I, started creating cooking videos of the things that I knew how to make. I connected with other Native people to compile more recipes and to film them and to get that material out. And then along the way, I have started doing other projects, including recipe development for Native producers to help them showcase their products. Um, I have worked on contract work like uh, creating a toolkit for food service directors to incorporate more native foods into their school lunch program. And sometimes I do catering gigs on, on <laughs> rare occasions. Who's, your, who's the intended audience for this? Are you trying to speak with ind indigenous communities? Are you trying to speak um, broadly to the, 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 the sort of broad population um, across the country, uh, globally? Who are you trying to um, engage? Yeah, I think my target audience has been Indigenous people, but there is definitely a recognition by folks outside of Indigenous communities that Indigenous knowledge has a lot of tools to help restore sustainable agriculture. And so I think also that people recognizing the plants and animals and history and gifts of the landscape create a within themselves uh, more recognition that they need to take care of it as well. And so that idea of reciprocity can help everyone, uh, not just indigenous folks. 
And so through Kitchen, what you're doing is you're sharing indigenous food systems and um, obviously recipes. Is this primarily to, um, what, to re-inspire healthful eating and to, to remind uh, indigenous communities what they've got and how they can use it? I mean, um, what do you want to achieve through this initiative? Yeah, I think that just having access to recipes can be really challenging for a lot of folks in our community, especially if we did not grow up reading cookbooks. Um, it can be challenging to start Googling all of the terminology in recipe books. And so I set out to make some of that information Googleable, but also to recognize that Indigenous recipes can use traditional ingredients, but can also be done in the modern kitchen. We are people of the 21st century, and we have always used the tools that we have access to. And we have learned how to recognize ancestral wisdom with our food systems while also making things relevant to ourselves today. Love the connection that you mentioned too between sort of some of these indigenous traditions and regenerative agriculture, sustainable agriculture. And I wanna come back to that in a minute, but before I go on to uh, Kendo and Mary, I have to ask you, since you talked about recipes and since you're talking about indigenous um, foods and systems, do you have a favorite recipe or a particular ingredient that to you is just the, the key ingredient? Um. I often say that my favorite recipe to make is bison and butternut squash lasagna. And one, it's because I'm a sucker for lasagna. Um, <laughs> but two, it really merges both my Blackfeet ancestry, which is, of course, a hunter-gatherer tradition. We are people of the bison on the plains. And my Cherokee ancestors, who were farmers, and that recognition to the squash that they grew. And so it's really easy you just cut up a butternut squash into rectangles um, and use them to replace lasagna noodles in a recipe and then just make a meat sauce. I generally use ground bison and tomato sauce and uh, you can always add fresh greens and peppers and onions and things and really make a nice rich sauce to it. And then you just layer it up and bake it until your squash is soft. Well, if you weren't in Rome now, I'd say the rest of us are coming over for dinner, but we'll do that another time. Kendo, I want to come over to you um, for you to talk a little bit about uh, what you're working on and your focus on Black culture and food. For sure, Frank. So that's where the farm plug came from. So it's it's really just a way of life and a, a movement. Farm plug, right? I just want to make sure everybody knows the name. Farm plug. Okay. Yeah, right. the farm plug. Exactly. So um, for Black Americans, the plug is like, it's colloquial for the person who has, oop, the lights went up, energy saving. For the person <laughs> who has, <laughs> the person who has the resources, right? They're the person who, whatever you need, um, if you need, if you need food, water, um, grocery, anything that you're looking for in your community, the plug is the person who has it, right? And so I had to figure out ways to make agriculture more attractive for my peers, right? Because for us, um, as young Black people in the United States, agriculture and food cultivation has very traumatic undertones, right? And so we can't engage that industry without first acknowledging the healing that's necessary. Um, but at the same time, it's also such a beautiful opportunity for not only healing, but entrepreneurship, for community building, all of the things that I know that my community really needs and thrives on and has always thrived on. So like the basic pillars of Farm Plug are educate, thrive, and connect. And educate um, is inspired from George Washington Carver um, to follow your curiosity to dream big and let your imagination lead you. Um, Thrive is inspired by Fannie Lou Hamer, right? The, the freedom farmer of the Mississippi Delta who took three pigs and took three pigs and ended up with a housing development, a housing cooperative to support over 150 people. And then the connect is inspired by the one and only Booker T. Washington and what he was able to do here at Tuskegee University. It was a school built by slaves, built by free people. Um, and we taught each other to this day, the trade, the head, heart, and the hands is, is what guides us. So I channel that energy in events that I throw. I popped up at Block parties. I used to work at summer camps, bringing all of that energy when I bounce around. So um, if I had to make it short, um, Farm Plug is really, is really a way of life. It's a movement for Black-led uh, land-based uh, healing and 
career development ultimately. Well, after we have um, a dinner with Mariah, we're coming over to you and to uh, <laughs> to to. Oh, to yeah. Um, I want you to talk a little bit more because I know that part of part of what Farm Plug tries to do is to connect farmers and people of color. Definitely. And I'm wondering, how do you do that? And um, why do you feel that is that connection is so important at this time? For sure. So I'm, I'm doing that in a couple of ways. So one of the most exciting ways is I'm actually about to come out with a coloring book and journal. Um, and the tagline is, I went to grad school, so you don't have to, uh, but it's like an A to Z book that explains food and environmental justice um, using very, very basic principles um, so that people can get a, a hold on this conversation and all of this discourse going back and forth. Another thing that I do is I have events, right, which is something like Croptober, where I bring black farmers and black people and black music and all of our culture and our vendors and our marketplace energy and we all come together on black land and we celebrate um i'm also on a board of a group called nature's garden for victory and peace and this weekend we're actually having our um annual healing arts and nature festival where we'll be doing the same thing bringing black land owners um it's family and friends open right so it's a family event where anyone from macon county anyone from anywhere can really come and get you know a real conversation with a farmer because for in the black in America the average farmer is 55 but for black Americans the average farmer is 65 so that's a lot of knowledge that's a lot of history that's a lot of you know civic engagement and real life uh lessons from the front lines that we have access to and by using land and food and music and culture um farm plug likes to bring all of these people together so we can navigate and have communications around what freedom looks like for us and how are you, and how are you doing engaging young people if we've got such an age gap right on mm -hmm. the farm especially on the black farm how are you doing at getting young people young black people engaged in this conversation and maybe in agriculture so it's a couple of ways right one is definitely entrepreneurship i don't care what anybody says young people love to hustle you know they want to make their own money and they want to be respected they want to earn their keep right and so i definitely use agriculture as a way to uh support and educate around what generational wealth looks like it's a big conversation in our community so the moment people find out like oh not only can i eat good but i can also make money from doing this yeah i think i'm interested in that um, and another way that I do it is, like I said, I've, I've worked at, at some awesome summer camps. And one of the most memorable experiences that I have is working for a group called Urban Growers Collective. And they actually won the Climate Innovation Cup at COP26 um, for, for the awesome, cool things that they're doing. Uh, but working there and just taking every opportunity that I have to educate students on how real food justice is, how real um, food sovereignty is, and how important they are for food security, not only for themselves, but for their communities and their families and for everyone's future. Okay, Mary, let me come over to you. That's just amazing, Kendo. I love what you're doing. And we're gonna we're gonna make this a conversation and open it up to the to the audience in a few minutes too. But um Mary, let's talk about your interests because um you talked about your 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 project in Scott. Uh but this is really about animal waste, right? That's what you told us. So yeah. how did you get interested? I mean, animal waste, where did that come from? Yeah, so um, when I was studying agronomy, I was really enthusiastic about insect production. Uh, I have read a lot of uh, article about the potential of insect to feed animals, to feed humans, but also to reduce food waste. And I thought it's amazing. We need to do something about that because it's a lot of, uh, you know, a theoretical concept, but there is no concrete application for using insect to uh, bioconvert carcass or unmarketable eggs or you know meat uh, meat residue coming from the transformation process. And uh, I was talking with um, two agronomists working uh, for a farm from in uh, a farm in Quebec. It's a hatchery, so it's a farm who produces uh, chicks uh, for the replacement of uh, chicken and other farm. And they had a lot of residue that they were just uh, taking away uh, to a rendering plant. And a rendering plant is a place where uh, the residue are transformed into animal meals um, by thermal treatment. So they are uh, 
like not burn, but they are eat and they are transformed into ingredients to feed the animals. So it's a good concept. It's a circular economic concept, but there is a lot of energy, energy cost and greenhouse gas emission. So talking with them, we decide that we want to do something about, about it. We want to fund a project and offer a service to the producer to valorize their waste in a more sustainable way by using the potential of insects. So insects are tools from nature to just transform carcass to new ingredient. It's the it's really the, the model from nature. We want to take that and put that in our farm production system. So let me see if I got this right. You have you take the insect, the insect basically div, the, feeds on the animal waste, right? The byproducts that would otherwise go into bad places, right? And then you use those same insects to feed back to the animals. So that becomes yes. the sort of circular system. Exactly. Like in nature, if a, an animal in nature die, insect will decompose it. And after that, the insect will be used to feed birds or you know, frogs and animal in the forest. So it's the same principle we want to take back in our farm instead of uh, eating the animals like a, like with the you know thermal treatment to transform it with high energy cost. Why do that when insects are perfect perfectly adapt to this condition to transform this waste in a more ecological way? So what kind of insect does this? Is there a particular insect that you're working with that is this magic circular agricultural? magic wand. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we work with black soldier fly larva. So it, it's not really common in North America, but you find a lot of that in South America or uh, in Asia. Uh, so it's a, a, a little bit bigger than the common uh, house fly we are used to. And then the advantage of this insect is that they grow really fast. You are really efficient on a wide variety of residue, like plant residue, animal waste, and also they are really the larvae are really rich in protein and fat. So it's really good quality ingredient to feed the, uh, livestock as pig, chicken, fish. Yeah. So let me just let me just stop you there to make sure everybody understands. What would you actually feed to the animals of this insect, and in what? in what form? You're not giving them handfuls of insects to eat. Yeah. So it's a possibility to take like the full complete larva to feed your chicken at home. It's a good source of protein, but it's more easy on a big scale to transform the larva to separate the protein from the fat. So you can uh, dry the larva and after ground it, and you know you have a floor that is easy to incorporate into the animal feed and to really respond to their nutritional need by separate the protein from the fat from some uh, minerals uh, ingredient, for example. So it's sort of an, an insect meal. It becomes kind of a yeah. meal that gets folded into the rest of their food diet. Insect meals instead of fish meal or soy meal that are associated with some ecological problems such as loss of biodiversity or deforestation. So it, it's interesting because we are creating new ingredients with our waste instead of exploiting a uh, resource. Well, I think we've established here that each, all of you, each of you is doing something remarkable and innovative through Indigit Kitchen, through Inscod, through Farmplug, all of you are doing uh, incredible things. Part of our conversation here today, too, is to think about how you tell that story so that others know about it, how you tell that story so that others may be inspired to join your movement or to add to, to the momentum. So um, let's just kind of whip around. Mariah, you want to go first? How do you tell your story? Yeah, I think that telling the story of our food systems is so important to the way that our audience receives it. Um, there is so much more to be gained by explaining why we're doing what we're doing before we even get into what it is that we do. And I think, you know, I ground my work in the land back home on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana, just next to the uh, Rocky Mountains, the backbone of the world, and just south of the Medicine Line or the Canadian border. And I think about what led me into this work, which is, of course, being 
back home from summer break and wanting a snack and not having a car and being 40 miles from the nearest grocery store and really understanding what it means to live in a place without access to grocery stores. And while that's defined as a food desert, that doesn't really define our actual proximity to food because there was plenty of food outside. And when I started understanding a bit more about the native plants that my people have eaten, how to cook them, how to use them, and also what to do with the pile of moose meat in our chest freezer, I really started to, one, have a great time cooking, um, but to want to share that information as well with folks that were in my community or folks in similar situations that uh, had been told that we had very little access to food, um, but in a place where my ancestors had been feeding themselves delicious and nutritious food for thousands of years. So that's part so of my story. Tell that, tell that story by explaining why and then what. And, and um, how, are your, how, how, how does your audience respond? I mean, I think food is a great vehicle through which to talk about a lot of other issues. Um, you know, we can talk about socioeconomic conditions that have imposed supermarket redlining in our communities. We can talk about food apartheid and the damage that actual policy decisions have made and the reasons why our access has been disrupted. We can talk about very intentional work by colonial governments to destroy indigenous people's food systems to take away our ability to feed ourselves so that we would be dependent on government food systems, subsidized rations and things of that sort. But we can do it while eating delicious food and figuring out remedies for all of these things as well. Kendo, how do you tell your story? I do it in two, two ways, Frank. I, first, I show up. And when I say I show up, I show up as myself, right? Green hair, you know, big earrings, my copper earrings, lip gloss popping. I show up as myself fully um, with all of my experiences. Um, like I said, being a Black woman, agriculture has taken me all over the world. So I've been able to learn sustainable beekeeping in Jamaica to eat Peking duck in Beijing, all because um, I'm connected to the land. And so um, when I show up and I tell people about, um, especially young people, right, in this globally connected world, and I tell them like, yeah, um, tomatoes and corn and, and hemp and industrial cannabis, all these things have taken me all over the world, y'all. And then they're like, well, I want to go, I want to travel. And so they're asking, they get to ask me questions. But the second way I do it, Frank, is by flipping the script. I ask them questions, right? Because I think we're under the, the impression, or maybe not this group of people here, uh, but a lot of people think that the youth don't know what's going on or that they're just floating around waiting for their turn to take on all these responsibilities. And I don't believe that at all, right? Especially being from a place like Chicago, um, where we had people like, you know, Mark Clark and Fred Hampton, who was a phenomenal Black Panther, spoke a lot about food insecurity and food justice on the west side of Chicago and was only what 22 or 23 when he passed that light is gonna keep taking me out um but those are the two ways that I do it Frank I, I ask questions and I show up fully as myself because ultimately it's about engagement right and, and I have this game that I play um with young people everywhere where I ask like well what do you want to be where, when you grow up and I bet you that I can connect it back to agriculture I bet you I can connect it back to climate change I bet you and that's what I call it myself like I bet you I bet you and um I just keep um asking them questions that helps them realize how intertwined their life is with food justice and food policy so when you're doing this um do you have an objective right you're you're you're, you're clearly engaging them but do you want to get them to change their behaviors to become farmers to join your movement what's what's the what's what's your desired outcome for your story Ultimately, I think I want everybody to be a plug. I want us all to be the ultimate plug. I want us to look at each other in our community as the natural resource. Um, so when we talk about natural resources, a lot of times we think about land and mines and, and coal and, and corn and all these things. But 
I think people are the natural, the most natural resource that we have, right? We communicate with each other. Um, we're a communal species. We need each other, especially um, Black communities and Black culture. We thrive on interconnectedness. So ultimately, I want to make agriculture sexy again, of course, and I want to connect ag and the culture, but I want to do it in a way that allows people to, I'm a big pleasure activist by Adrian Marie Brown, if you all are, are familiar, it's a book, definitely recommend it. Um, but I'm a strong believer that when people feel good and they're doing things that makes them happy, it's easier for them to imagine a world where everyone can do things that feels good and makes them happy without taking away or limiting the freedoms of everyone else. So ultimately, Frank, my objective is to inspire. My objective is to connect, is, is to educate, thrive, and connect. I want people to learn about everything, all of the opportunities that are around them from the soles of their feet to the air that they breathe above their heads. I want them to know that survival is just the bare minimum, right? We're going to survive anyway, because that's what we've always done as not only humans, but as Black people specifically. But our generation and the age of technology, we don't have to settle for survival. We can thrive and we can do that not only by educating ourselves, but also connecting and being intentional with the connections that we make to each other and to our elders who, again, have all of this knowledge and have really done this work already and are really just waiting for us and our energy to impart that wisdom upon us. Well, I'm thinking if anybody can inspire in the mission that you've laid out, you can do it because you're doing it here. But um, uh, Mariev, your story is a little bit different because you're you're doing the research on this project. You aren't. It's not a business quite yet. Um, and it's insects about animal waste. So it may not be the story that most people want to tell before they sit down to dinner. So how do you tell this story and, and how do you make this something uh, that people care about? Yeah, so it's it's kind of a challenge with auto technology because people associate insect with something disgusting or you know uh, scary, and um, especially Westerners uh, are reluctant to eat insect directly. So when we talk about the uh, human eating insect, because there is it's full of flavor and texture and uh, nutrients, and I really no, enjoy eating insect for my part. But I think we have, you know, some limitation because of you know cultural or emotional experience. And what I see is that young people are really more open mind about uh, edible insect production and eating insect. And uh, during my study, I have done a lot of uh, presentation in school with uh, young children, but also some teenagers with them, uh, because we have a chair in the production and the transformation of visible insect at the university, so we can talk uh, to child uh, in school. And yet, uh, the the young people are ready to try uh, to try insect. They want to change their way to, of eating to uh, do a difference for the environment. So I, I really talk, uh, like to talk with them. And with the older people, I think, you really have to uh, present them the option to feed animal with insect. So the if they don't want to change their food habit, and it's okay because it's okay to enjoy your food and have good experience, they can think about the way their food is produced. So what are what is the feed their animals they are eating are receiving like you can eat a chicken feed with soy or you can eat a chicken feed with insect coming from waste so it's really it's all about the way you produce the food i think and people are really open to eat more uh, ecological food so it's the part of the story that i uh, try to uh, put uh, in front when I talk about edible insect and auto technology and all the potential of insect to make a difference for the environment. And yeah, about animal waste, I think a lot of people just don't know about like what happened with the carcass of dead animals in farm, what happened with the extra manure, what happened with the residue from the transformation. People just sometimes think it's disappear, but no, like there is some, uh, ecological cause with the treatment of this carcass and all this waste and it should not be considered as waste but it should be considered as resource because there are still rich in nutrients they still have a lot of potential and it should continue to be used to produce food so yeah i try to just inform and i think it's a complicated story because you're asking people to understand a food system that they don't understand mostly yeah 
but they it's important. The market, they buy a piece of meat if they if they eat meat. It's wrapped in plastic. They take it home. They don't see the animal. They don't see the process. That you know. So we've got a lot of. That's why the storytelling matters is because we've got mm -hmm. to educate people. But most people aren't going to go out of their way, Mary Ev, to read about how animals are slaughtered or what happens to the waste. So we have to find ways to tell that story in in ways that people can accept and understand, and not mm -hmm. just gross out. If I can use a term. I think I when you understand a system, you want to make a difference. You want to protect it. Like uh, Maria uh, said, like if you know where your food comes from, from the landscape, you want to take care of the landscape. I think it's the same with the food, food production system. You need a good understanding to want to make an action and change in your habit. Sure. Can I ask, do you eat insects yourself? Yeah, I produce insects in my apartment in Quebec City, and uh, I really enjoy eating insects. But at the start, at the start of my study at, at university, I was really, um, Mariah, really are, are insect. <laughs> Mariah, are insects in any of your cooking uh, cookbooks and recipes? I don't have any insects in any of my recipes, but I do have some frozen cicadas in the freezer at home. Um, because after George Washington burned the Haudenosaunee villages and um, eliminated all of their food stores, it was a year that the cicadas emerged. And so they were how the people were able to feed themselves after um, George Washington ordered General Sullivan to march on the people. So cicadas have a very special place in Haudenosaunee food culture um, and a recognition that the land will take care of us. Kando, any insects in your diet? Um, that'll be a no for me, Frank. Um, <laughs> not high on the list. Um, uh, we'll, we'll let you work together. We'll get there. All right. I want to remind our audience that if you have questions for uh, any of our wonderful guests here or panelists, use the Q&A function and put your question in and I'll, I'll pass that along. And while we're, while we're waiting for that, I want to throw a question out to the three of you and encourage a, a conversation amongst you and feel free to pose a question to one another or however you want to do this. But it's, it's, it's sort of going global on this issue a little bit. You know, we talked at the outset of this thing about how the, the, um, uh, the, the 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 objective and the focus of of World Food Day and 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 what FAO is doing is trying to focus this year's theme on leave no one behind better production nutrition and better environment for a better life all right and how central food is to that and yet because of political humanitarian and any number of other um, um, realities that we confront we have a billion people or nearly a billion people who are confronting food insecurity in this world. And we have food deserts in this world, and we have people who don't have access to the kinds of healthy and, and, and affordable and accessible food that they should have. I just want to open it up to the three of you for your thoughts on this and, and, and whether and how you feel you and youth, because our focus here is on what young people are doing, can change this and, and, and how. Um, you're each doing something very important, and you're doing you're doing something um, in your own sphere. You're also reaching out. So maybe Mariah, you want to go first. You're in Rome now, so you might have the most kind of global perspective on this right now because of where you are. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a tremendous interest by youth to participate in agricultural system. Um, I am really lucky that I've been able to work with indigenous youth uh, through the Intertribal Agricultural Council and the um, phenomenal organizations or summits that they have around the United States. Um, and there is a lot of interest by young people, not just in becoming farmers and ranchers and food producers, but also recognizing that food systems are multifaceted and require chefs, they require lawyers that work in these systems of food knowledge. I have been on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC and lobbied senators and congressmen and was in the White House lobbying for the last farm bill. Um, but I also remember our elders 
you know, we had elected tribal leaders in the White House for a meeting and they sat down and they listened to the tribal leaders speak. And then this representative from the White House was trying to leave the room. And one of our elders, I remember, said this, it, like we brought our youth here, like in our way, you need to listen to our youth. And we're like, we will all step aside. None of the other tribal leaders will speak, but we need to hear from our youth. Um, and they let the young people speak. Um, and they trusted the young people to explain what our needs were, what we were asking for in the farm bill. Um, and I think that that is really the way for some of these global leaders to um, essentially walk the talk and prove that uh, the young people are the leaders of the future and they can do that by, by letting folks lead today. Other thoughts from Kendo or, or Maria? I think uh, young people uh, will have to learn how to be more resilient with the climate change because when when we will get older, I think all the you know the climatic condition or the resource we have access for agriculture will be more limited. So we will have to be adapt to this situation, and I think the work is really start now. We can start the change for the moment, so we will be ready when that happens. It's already happening, but you know. It will just continue the the climate change. So yeah, I think to be more resilient, we need to connect with our agriculture to know where our food comes from, how to produce food, how to diversify our production system also, so we can be autosufficient. We can produce all the food we need to respond to our nutritional needs. And yeah. It's important to start learn at a young age how to produce food, how to be resilient, and how we can make a difference. So we will be with. Kendo, anything you want to throw in? Yeah, man, I I consider myself an an Afrofuturist of, of sorts, right? So I am really big on looking to the past. You know, practicing the principle of Sankofa, looking to the past in order to figure out um, what works in order and in, in order to move forward. And I think what the youth really need is support from us, right? Because they from one, are- From one another, is that what you're saying? I, no, not, I mean, of course, from one another, but I, I think from us, right? As a, I'm a millennial, right? So Generation Z needs support from me as a millennial to be able to, you know what I'm saying? Carve out these spaces for their wild ideas to be, you know, to be heard, you know, and to be uplifted and amplified. I think that, you know, to be born, you know, and know how to work a cell phone, right? To, to be born and, you know what I'm saying, have a computer in the palm of your hand and know what that is and, and to be in the metaverse and know how to matriculate in it around three, four and five years old. I mean, we have young people that know how to code. You know, we're talking about building augmented realities where reality is layered on top of digital. And so I think we have to, the I think really the challenge is for us as the grownups of the world, right? To get um, the limitations and experiences that we have experienced and, you know, the boundaries imposed on us by adulting in this age or whatever. I think we need to move out of the way. And I think we need to inspire, again, inspire young people to dream bigger. Uh, because in a world where, um, like you said, Frank, it's over 1 billion people are hungry, but we still blasting off into space. You know, they're selling tickets on Virgin Galactic for $250,000. So if you can afford it, you can touch the moon. And, um, you know, and I think it's also very important that we're intentional about being honest about capitalism, um, being honest about hyper consumerism and being honor honest about um, anti-Blackness and the way that these discriminatory policies really trickle down and impact us all over the world. And I think until we're honest about these things, that we're doing a disservice to young people that are coming up and facing very real challenges from, you know, from these discriminations that have shaped the reality that we're all forced to deal with today. Um, I have several, I mean, I think you all make incredibly good points, and there, there is a, and we see this through the Planet Forward project, there is a capacity now, too, that young people have to amplify their voices that no other generation has ever had. No other generation has been able to connect like this, this quick, has been able to connect globally like this, right? So, 
um, the, 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 the potential, the power is there, how it gets used and how it gets translated and how it gets uh, implemented is the big question. So, okay, well, speaking of questions, we got lots of them from the audience. So, oh, did you want to say something? Hendo? Do you, I see your hand up. Yeah, it was just making me think about um, Xenon, girl of the 21st century. I know um, some of us might remember that, but like growing up seeing like Raven on TV where little braided pigtails and a spaceship on outer space with a friend, like that was super cool. And, and to think about things like the International Space Station, like this is real. The things that we're seeing on TV are so real. So, you know, I, we don't like media sometimes, but hey, it has the potential to really like to catalyze imagination. And I think that's something that we should not shy away from. I totally, totally agree. Okay, great questions. I got one for you, Kendo, from, from Vaughn. When and where can we buy your book? Oh, wow. that's called Pressure, and he applied it. Um, it is not out yet, but um, I am on the internet everywhere as Farm Plug. So if you type in Farm Plug or Kendo the Farm Plug, it'll be me popping up and click that. And as soon as it drops, uh, you all will be the first to know. So thank you for okay, that. Well, so while we're at it, uh, Mariah, where can people buy your book? I have no book, but people can get plenty of recipes for recipe, free recipe, online at a yeah. Digi Kitchen. Um, and then I'm planning on working on a children's cookbook when I go into winter hibernation mode. It's still, okay, still so hunting they, season. They go to in Digi Kitchen for your recipes and they can yes. download, they can see and download. Okay. All right. Let's go to some other questions here. Some, some, some good ones. Um, uh, and I think this is a this is a very interesting one, also from Bon. Actually, question for any of our of the panelists: How can we encourage more connection to our food systems within urban communities? And Kendo, I know you've talked about being a a, a kid from from Chicago, so you know urban communities. Uh, you want to go first on this one? Yeah. So. I mean, it's kind of interesting, right? Because, you know, I grew up on the South Side, but the East Side to be specific. So I think that Chicago was one of the more greener cities. Um, we have a lot of uh, parks that are sponsored by the city through Chicago Park District, and they do a lot to get kids outside. So, but that's something that I would definitely say is to look at your community and figure out some ways that you can keep your community green. Um, cause we know about, uh, heat islands and things like that. People like Malcolm X since, you know, the seventies and the sixties been talking about, um, you know, the conditions in the quote unquote hood and things like that. So, um, I think there's plenty to advocate and move around when it comes to like policy and getting um, more green spaces in our communities and gaining more access to those communities. But I think that, you know, my 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 advisor has this quote where he says everyone everyone's first occupation when they're born is an ecologist so everyone is running around you, when you're figuring out how to walk you're crawling you're touching things you're tasting you're engaging your senses right and i think that even in the city uh it's an it's always an opportunity to engage your senses right and if you get opportunities to get out of the city or to find this quiet little peaceful place in the city to engage your senses there right and then imagine feel the difference in how you feel you know practice that meditation and figure out what it really feels like what is the difference in the air quality that you're breathing closer to the train versus in your in your room at the dinner table or something like that so i would say definitely look for sensory experiences um, I'm always a proponent for going out to eat and trying different foods because culture is the best way to travel if you can't afford it like me. Um, those taste buds can take you anywhere that you want to go. And anyone who's serving you good food from their heart definitely wants you to know about their culture too. So you'd be surprised at the type of relationships and the type of experiences you can get um, just from asking questions of, of your waiter or of your restaurant owner and things like that, especially in urban places. Let me turn to, to Mariah and Mariah. Have anything you'd add to, to this question about how to get people in urban communities more connected to the food systems? I need, I, I think, you know, everyone needs food. <laughs> so uh, I think everyone can have this, co this connection with agriculture and food production systems. So we need to create opportunity for people to try agriculture at home or at school uh, with uh, some uh, community garden or with some school project that, uh, can uh, initiate kids with the agriculture so they can create this connection, know where their food uh, is coming from. And yeah, I think yeah, we need to create new opportunity like that. 
I'd say wherever you are, um, wherever you go, find a plant app for your phone. Um, step outside your hotel room, your apartment building, wherever, and do some plant IDs on, on some plants. Learn about some of the, the local plants. Um, some of them you may find out are edible. Um, I was just down in Tucson, and so I got to walk around, and I saw prickly pear and mesquite and agave all just like in the hotel parking lot. So lots of fun food stories right there. But also, I think that learning the plants um, in your city, on your street, in, in urban areas too, helps you form that connection to space um, and place and helps you feel more rooted and connected and helps you recognize how many presents the earth is trying to give you. Um, and then, you know, if you take something, if you take a, a branch off a pine tree to make tea or something, maybe you give something back and you bring it some water or some tobacco or something like that. So um, that's my recommendation. I have a great question here from Kyla, which brings us back to the storytelling theme we were on earlier. Kyla asks, <clears throat> how do we leverage our stories to demand awareness and direct action on the food crisis uh, around the globe? So leveraging stories to get awareness and action. Um, Mariah, why don't you lead us off with this one? Since again, you're in Rome right now, which is where a lot of this conversation is taking place. Yeah, um, I think, I guess the first thing is establish what kind of action you wanna ask for. Um, and then back up from that spot. Um, you know, what will be the motivating factor to help people want to perform the action that you are asking them to do. Um, you know, there's policy change, there is land back, there is um, reduced food waste, there is um, finding regenerative agricultural solutions and implementing policies that will actually make that happen. Uh, there are lots of things that you may be asking for. And then I always think that it's helpful to connect that with a personal story, um, to connect it to your own experiences, because it is much easier for people to remember stories than it is for them to remember statistics. Yes. So, you know, if you have a story of, you know, I heard a story today about a from a wonderful South African woman who had brought what she called magic beans. They are a traditional ground nut in her community. But, you know, she could talk about the nitrogen fixing properties of them. But I remember her talking about how her grandma farmed them. And uh, her grandma, you know, she would go out in the field with her grandma and they would pick the beans together they would sort them and package them up into bags and they would take them into the market and she remembers just being at her grandma's elbow height and helping her grandma sell these beans in the market and she said that her grandma put her dad through medical school and her uncle through his doctorate just and as women they also get uh, a bag of beans when they get married because that is a sign of wealth. And so this is a food that had fallen out of fashion in South Africa and she wanted to revitalize it. And so I heard that story today and I can't remember the name of the beans, <laughs> but I can tell you all of these other things about the beans. Um, and I'm pretty sure I could backtrack and find the beans because they have told me a whole bunch of fun, cool things. And also about a cool drought resistant nitrogen fixing plant. And, and what you say is really important, too, to, for people to know that this story, to, you know, people remember stories and they'll remember people often, probably mostly before they'll remember stats and facts. Um, I got a lot of other questions here, so I, I want to I want to move on um, and I'll pop them around because some of them are. Uh, this is a question for you, Mariev, from Susanna. Her question is, how fast do insects eat the animal waste? 
it's really really fast it's always depend of the volume of insect you put you put on a carcass but generally for a black soldier fly for example in only two weeks they complete their larval stage so you put a a, a larva small like this you you can you can't really see it and in two weeks it will become like big like that and it's ready to harvest and to feed you animals so they are so efficient it's like magic you know <laughs> it's there is magic bean and there is magic uh, larva and yeah it's really impressive at first it can look disgusting but after that you just learn how to appreciate it and see how nature is uh, is great <laughs> uh, it, even in in french maria i think beauty is in the eye of the beholder translates to this <laughs> so uh, Ando, here's a question for you um how many young farmers do you know and do you work with oh just give me a platform okay no i it's so many i can't even count but um there are some key key groups that come to my mind that have some phenomenal fun. When I say like creme de la creme, I'm trying to practice my friends. Um, they are phenomenal, phenomenal. So that makes me think of, like I mentioned earlier, uh, nature's, nature's Garden for Victory and Peace. You've got the National Black Food Justice Alliance, who is led by two beautiful, awesome Black women, Dr. Jazz and Cicely Garrett. Um, you've also got Acres of Ancestry, which is also going super hard. You got SAFON, which is S-A-A-F-O-N, the Southern Southeastern African American Farmer Organic Network. You've got in Chicago, um, in Chicago, you got the um the Chicago Food Policy Action Council and Advocates for Urban Agriculture, which is filled. When I say I, I go hard for my city, I am not going to lie. I think a lot of cities are doing a lot of things to go green. But I would argue that Chicago and the United States is one of the most forward thinking, one of the most green, uh, energy friendly places. And they are doing some amazing things. And especially for it to be black led and have you know, just the places of leadership that Black youth are in is amazing. Then you got uh, up in Detroit, the Detroit Food Security Network, they going crazy. Um, if you connect to any 1890 university or any HBCU, any historic Black college or university, we are filled with young Black, not only farmers, but aspiring farmers, people who understand the value and the dignity and earth work and earth cultivation and working with your hands. And we are all over the place, but that is just a few um, that I would name. And even if you follow me on Instagram, just scroll through my followers, you'll see a lot of people um, that I work with. We actually just this past weekend just had the Black Urban Growers Summit in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, it's like places you wouldn't imagine. Like, what are, what are you know, Black people in Boston? And I'm not even gonna lie, for a long time, it was hard for me to imagine Black people in Boston, but they are there and they do farm and they go really hard in, 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 in their uh, respective areas. So, you know, being in these spaces, once you meet one of us, we'll all just start coming out the woodworks, I promise. So look at any of those uh, people or groups or organizations I just mentioned, and I guarantee you will find yourself down the rabbit hole of not only beautiful Black people, but beautiful Black land owners, uh, stewards, and cultivators, for sure. Love it, love it, love it. All right, we don't have much time, just a couple of minutes. I want to fold these last two questions together and then get each of you to answer as quickly as you can, maybe no more than a minute each, because we want to let everybody get on with their with their lives. And we've had a very, uh, very fulsome discussion here this hour. So this question is from Noor. What's the biggest change that you think must happen for us to improve the agriculture, agriculture sector, especially with farmers? And I'm going to pair that with this question from Maria. What's your message to skeptics of those who don't think that these are urgent, important issues that need to be resolved and that you're addressing? So it's, you know, what do you say to the skeptics? And you can do that in a breath or two. And then what do you think is the biggest change that, that needs to happen? And, and Mariev, why don't you go first? Yeah, I think there is a, a real emergency with climate change and we should be in the emergency to, inf to involve ourselves in our agriculture and to find new so solution. And I think we have to be ambitious about the solution we propose. At, at the point we are, nothing is impossible. We just have to put the effort, put the energy, uh, take the idea from young people and work to apply it. That. Great. Mariah, biggest change? What's your message to skeptics? 
Oh, my message to skeptics or the thing I want to change. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to stop using the term conventional agriculture and start saying destructive agriculture. Instead of making regenerative sound like that, that's the thing, let's just, um, let's call out the new system that's not working for us um, because regenerative agriculture has been practiced on the land for much, much longer. Um, and we can do it with new technologies and we can recognize how to bring that, um, th those thoughts into the 21st century. Um, and as was mentioned, it's very doable, um, but we need to change the language in which we're talking about it so that people realize the urgency in which this needs to be approached. Great. Kendall, bring us home. Well, my message to skeptics would be, don't believe me, just watch. Um, you don't have to believe it. Uh, again, we say this all the time. Science is not something you can believe in. It's fact. This is what we're seeing. It's what we're experiencing. And we don't need people to believe what we're going through for us to know that, it's, that it is what we are experiencing. Um, and with that, uh, that is the biggest change that we need in agriculture. We need more diverse faces, more diverse voice, voices at the forefront. We need big agriculture and really all nations to in, embody an element of restorative justice, um, to be honest about, you know, the role of discrimination all over the world and how it impacts the decisions that we make every single day, especially in the face of climate change. So, you know, I would say the biggest change in ag is we, we need more farm plugs, Frank. Look, the lights went out. I'm done. That was it. We need more farm floods, right? <laughs> I think we need more of all of you. So I want to thank you on behalf of, of FAO North America and Planet Forward uh, and all of us, really, for, for this incredible and inspiring conversation. You're innovators, you're storytellers, and you're bold, all of you. And it's, and it's, and, and it's what we need. Uh, and it's, it really helps kind of reinforce this year's theme, right? Leave no one behind, better production, better nutrition, better environment, a better life. And um, on behalf of uh, all of us, as I say, at, at FAO and Planet Forward, uh, thank you, thank you very much. We look forward to working uh, with FAO to share youth stories, uh, to move the planet forward. So check us out at planetforward.org. Thank you all very much. Good luck to you.